Everyone includes everyone, which equals community. Okay, Go so ahead, I thank you, Lucina. So I'm Lana Small, and I work for a large nonprofit in White um, in New York. Um, and we were brought together again as professionals and parents and advocates. So if you look at our graphic, we're going to go from left to right as we develop. So here we started out as a group of people, quite separate, not knowing each other, a group of strangers. And we decided to give ourselves a name because we thought that that was one way to sort of bring ourselves together and start defining who we are. So we came up with the name New Yorkers Creating Community. Very community um, centered, um, the idea that we're in this together, even though we started out being um, individuals. And um, I'm going to let Marietta take it to the next step where we came to Pathfinder Studio. So we've come to Pathfinder Studio and we are on this continual journey of how do we keep growing, changing, evolving, sharing, and elevating ourselves in order to continue to be in the space where we can support others in building their community. And so I'm just gonna transfer over to uh, Jim. Passed through Pathfinder Studio, but that's not the end. We're we're continuing the journey post Pathfinder Studio, and we're we're heading toward some future, some some future that we can't see completely. It it goes off the end of the uh, of the page. From where we stand, we can't see the future, but we're aiming toward through that growth, that change, that sharing. We're aiming toward a future in which, uh, as Lana put it last night, we we want to stay curious about the people we work with. We want to not settle. We want to stay creative. And and by the way, I'm I'm the father of two young adults with IDD. I'm not a professional. Uh, I'm an amateur advocate. Uh, my paid job is very different from that. So we had the we had this cloud that uh, is extending off the page. And uh, Sanaya suggested, well, the cloud is fine, but let's let's have more than just a monochromatic cloud. So uh, at her suggestion, we added uh, this rainbow to it coming off of the cloud, again, presenting this hopeful future that we're heading toward together, having been initially brought together by Marietta having passed through the Pathfinder studio. And as we emerge from the Pathfinder studio, having a shared commitment to change and growth and elevation. Sanaya? You're and muted. You Hi. Why we uh, we were discussing about um, what questions, probes, and possibilities are possible. Um, I thought about my son, who always has a very innocent question on his expressive body language, and then I came up with a few questions, a few probes. And then um, the possibilities were also through his express expression that I tried putting it down. Um, like, um, even because this is all about organizations and how people um, should be treating other people. But the most important thing is people feeling how they want to be treated as well. So I felt my son would be asking, how should we see people? He would say, see me with love, a gaze so tender in your eyes, 
warm and understanding render. How should we hear people? Hear me with the heart. Attune to my song. In the melody of empathy, we both belong. How should we mobilize people? Walk with my feelings, step by step. Through the valleys of joy, the mountains of depth. How should we train people? Fly with my thoughts like a bird in the sky. Unbounded by limits, together we'll fly. And then my son always, when I ask him what he says, no, please, no more, please. And then hand in hand, let's venture, you and I, to the vast landscapes where dreams touch the sky. In the symphony of connection, we are a shining star. See me with love and we'll go far. See me with love and we'll go far. Thank you. So that's what we have is a group of people who come together, a commitment to move forward and a vision for what we want to achieve, which is to grounded in love, move far together. Very good work. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. And again, I had never heard of your organization again until um, Pathfinders was able to connect, you know, all these wonderful organizations together. And, you know, it's just been a blessing to be able to hear all the wonderful things that you guys have done because I've shared in my base group um, with uh, Lana, you know, so I've known a little bit about some of the things in your incredible work. So I just applaud you all. Um, so thank you for sharing. So I, I just feel the need to clarify, we, we didn't exist until 10 weeks ago. So that's what, that's one reason you never wow. heard of us. <laughs> yeah. That we, is mind blowing to me. Well, we existed as individuals, of course, but yes. uh, I'm older than 10 weeks. It's yeah. hard to tell. <laughs> that's awesome. That's mind blowing. That's awesome. Yes. All right. So we had a little technical issue. So you're not going to see a bunch of fancy stuff. You'll just hear some nice words, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll try to figure out our technical stuff and upload some stuff later. Yeah. Um, so when we were looking at, now I'm, San, I'm Sandy Cooper, for those of you that I haven't met yet. And I'm the executive director at Neighbors Incorporated on the community living side of our organization, which is, I always love to say this, it's the side of the organization that started it all. <laughs> <laughs> where Patty's brilliance just kind of first hit the map. So that's always just really a wonderful place to kind of live in my space, in my workspace. So our question last week, when we were kind of going through this process, we've grown uh, since then, but last week, our question was, what does a good life look like? How do we continue to deepen partnerships and supporting people to live life in grace, happiness, and love? And continue to be very intentional in all those areas. And then that took us to another question. So when we were looking at this too, and we were kind of doing our bubbles around, we were looking at what does a good life look like? Of course, it looks like having family and it looks like having friends, of course, growing in our community, participation and efforts in our dreams, having them, following them, being able to safely say what they are, um, and have a home that we can really feel safe in and be able to go out and do our good work and have people come into our home and feel as it, it's their a, my home or their home and not just this programmy thing that folks like to kind of partner when they're coming from outside areas and looking in at us. And our question then took us to, what does being intentional look like or feel like. Um, and Chrissy has a really nice example of what intentional can look like and where following a thread can take you. Um, so Chrissy's going to share a little bit about her curiosity around being intentional. 
Thank you, Sandy. Um, so yes, I work for neighbors and I'm one of the advisors that has have the pleasure to work with people out in the community and their residential homes. Um, and because I've been given the gift of working with neighbors, we have this wonderful opportunity to get, um, we want to make sure that we have intention with regards to the community that's, that people li li live in so they have can maybe start to build their own relationships within regards to those communities. So I tend to find myself always wanting to volunteer somewhere, always have volunteered for 20 some plus years with regards to different community organizations. There's this one organization that caught my eye. Um, they were called Angels Sharing the Warmth and it was founded by Christine Fallows. And she was feeding and clothing the homeless in Philadelphia. Then she had transitioned, she still does that, but then transitioned up into our area. Um, it's a, our area that, you know, that, she will also do veterans and some of the housing um, developments that are a little bit less income funded and they have fundraisers. So I would volunteer with them, trying to just get to know them because they were like-minded. So I'm like, okay, they're out there doing their thing. Let me go spend some time and get to know them. Well, as that relationship grew and my relationship with Bernadette had also grown, I learned a little bit about Bern because she was just new to our organization because she just moved in. So then I was talking to Bern about, oh, I have to go volunteer and make some, you know, peanut butter sandwiches for, you know, some of the homeless people. Would you like to join? So then she would just come along with me to make the sandwiches. So it all started out with just making some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. She got to meet some new people. And then it started with, okay, now we're going to feed them for Thanksgiving and donate and go get collections for Christmas. So then we would do that sporadically through the year. Then it came into that she was feeling really comfortable with these individuals that she got to meet and wanted to then volunteer for the organization. So they would have an annual fundraiser every August, they have a fundraiser. So now this is the second year that Byrne has been blessed to be able to go and be a part of it. And she has her stations. Like this year she was, she had her own stop on the poker run. Like she was giving out the cards and doing the, you know, the dabbing and, and all the baskets and donations that we were able to go out and get with her for her to be able to raise money to give back to the area and the people that she has developed relationships with. So after a couple of years of working with this organization, Vern needed to have a new housemate with regards to, you know, their other one transitioned out and she needed to have somebody else stay with her. Well, through working with this organization, she ended up meeting someone that ended up wanting to partner with her in her own home. So we were blessed enough to be able to go through that process with the new young lady and just, just the relationships that we have seen develop just by having conversations with complete strangers and where it's developed and how it's helped people is just, I'm, it's just astonishing just by having conversations to say, Hey, how you doing? How can I help? Did I use my time? You did. You did use your time. And Alice, it has an opportunity. Bernadette is the person that we're kind of focused with because we all have a relationship with Bern, including Josh, who's not with neighbors, but he's Bernadette's support coordinator. So we thought this would be a great thread to follow for a minute. But mm -hmm. Alice is Bernadette's advisor and has had a chance to kind of hear how nurturing these relationships have really been helpful. So Alice, what have you learned by just being with Bern around some of the I learned how people want to um, spend time with, with Burn, want to be part of Burn's life. Um, I learned that she makes um, people happy in the sense of willing to be in her life, share her journey, um, help her, and stay. I want to stay connected with her even as a friendship part, you know, and not just because um, we they help her in work relating, but um heard sharing the charity work such as um making um sandwiches for the um the shelter she seems to love that um courtney i mean i'm sorry not courtney stacy shared how much she cared about burn in this short period of time and want to be part of her part of her you know her health part of her, her friendship just just basically whatever she could do for her she wants to be part of it yeah. so that shows that her Thank growth you. in that short period of time she got, she's sticking, she's sticking to the people with their hearts, with their thoughts, with their, you know, feelings and just wants to grow with her. And I like that, um, mm -hmm. that she's opening the door to 
allow people in and people's coming in welcoming like like fact we got to have to hold out and we're gonna have to put some hold out there man we got all this rush coming in no because <laughs> she's so wonderful people are just keep coming i have so many people wanting to work with her or, or just come in and just you know meet with her you know and but bernie's busy i have to tell you she likes to do her activity <laughs> so you gotta get her you gotta give her a little you know space there so she wants to have her own freedom too you know but if you if you talk to burn she's enjoying her the relationship part. And I think that is the big part that is helping her succeed in life is the relationship part with strangers, with um, just with neighbor staff, with people. And it wasn't an easy transition. This took time. This took a lot of time for all of us that we invested in. So I just don't even think this just happens overnight. So, mm -hmm. but Alice picked up the torch for me. So I'm letting her have burned now and I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> What Sharon is caring. I know. <laughs> peace, peacemaker is in a bad situation over here. You can see him there. Wave peace. <laughs> he he's in a very noisy area. So I'm going to do peace's little part of this. Um, so peacemaker is one of he's a younger part of our team, younger in that he's been here for a shorter period of time than some of the rest of us, but he's also young um in age. And he has just hit this field like a blaze. And I think being a part of this, and I'll just speak to it because he and I've spent some time being a part of Outfitters, I think for you, Peace has really helped you grow and think about things pretty differently, mm -hmm. even though his heart has always been in the best places. So Peace is curious about this. His question that we wanted to satisfy was, how do we increase the health, healthy relationship for a gentleman that he supports that's had a really rough time recently? And hearing some of these other stories, our commitment to continuing growth, to continue to be intentional, in our group, we decided we're really going to connect with Peacemaker in a kind of a different way and the person that he works for and maybe help them find a group similar to the folks that Bernadette has found in her community, a group of men that, that his gentleman that he works for can maybe connect with where he can really put his generous heart. The gentleman we work for has a very generous heart. Sometimes he's misunderstood, but how do we kind of help him get connected to something like that? The other thing the group is going to do to help be intentional, to see some growth, to really support peace and a younger team that's supporting the his gentlemen is to kind of figure out ways that we can be really intentional about inviting them out and inviting him out to places where he can feel comfortable to be himself because he gets so worried about messing up socially that he puts so much pressure on himself. Sometimes he does have a little oops in the community because he's so worried about saying something wrong or not doing something right. So we want to create soft landings for him. So if there is a moment, he can have a learning space from it with a trusting group of people that really understands how he walks through life and his rhythm. And that will also benefit the team that's working with him to kind of maybe find new and interesting ways to support him. Um, so that's one of the things we're working on around that, just to be a partner and to continue the work, continue to be intentional, continue to follow the threads and the shifts and the themes and see where that goes and help peace and the folks like that really kind of narrow down in that, at least for that one person in that particular community. And then Josh is going to take us towards an end to this conversation and his role in our lives and in the lives of people we work yeah. for. Thanks, Sandy. Um, <clears throat> so as Sandy mentioned, I am not a part of Neighbors, so to say, um, but we do work very closely together in a lot of different situations. Um, this one in particular with Bernadette, um, just a little bit of history, if, if we have a second. Um, Bernadette, for us as an organization, was the very first person we ever supported. Um, so <clears throat> this story of <laughs> her thrive in the community and develop all these natural connections and relationships and, you know, people wanting to spend time with her outside of that paid role, um, for me is, is, is amazing, um, you know, and seeing how far that she's come as a person. Um, in the time that she's been on her own, right? So I've seen her, you know, she lived with her with her her father for, you know, a, a couple of years while we were supporting her. And then, you know, the introduction to neighbors occurred. Um, and just seeing the difference in in the person that Bernadette was and is 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 amazing, right? So I, I take a step back from that and I look at at us as an organization, right? Because we support folks outside of neighbors 
that may live on their own or live with other organizations or, you know, some folks live in group homes or with their parents or whatever their situations are. Um, so, you know, I look at it and I'm like, okay, number one, how can I, in my, in my position with the, with my organization, I'm the executive director and, and sort of the founder in, of, of us, how can I spread what neighbors has done right with Bernadette to other areas of the organization and, and help other folks that we work for? Um, you know, that's number one, right? So part of it is educating my group, right. On, on how to do it and what to do and maybe what to look for. Um, but also, you know, even in the Milford, uh, you know, the area where, where Bernadette lives, there's other folks that I've been in contact with um, that I don't support, but I'm, I'm part of their li life in, in one way or another. Um, you know, how can I work with them and maybe find other volunteer groups or, you know, open up this specific group to other folks, um, you know, in the area. So, you know, it's been a it's, it's been a pleasure um, to say the least. Um, watching the growth that's occurred during this time and 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 being part of Burns life and and seeing again, seeing how we can help other folks, you know, from what we've learned. Yeah, we've made a commitment on our teams to to anywhere Josh would like to kind of explore something. We want to kind of try to do it together and see what that looks like. What does it look like to pull that thread out there and see where, you know, where we can go next? With and the the thing we're trying to be really caught cautious about is to go through this conversation and not have not walk into it with expectations but to walk into it with curiosity so because i think then you're more open to what might come so we're really trying to practice that in our going forward because oftentimes we want things to come so quickly like we have our own agenda already in our head like i gotta check this off and <coughs> just walking into it to see where the next thing would take her and the next thing would happen. And it all started around some of the things that she was just interested in. And she followed that carrot to see where it would take us. So we're trying to use that as our, our model to be mindful about just be curious. So anyway, that's where we are. We're gonna just be curious, curious, and curious. <laughs> and intentional, intentional, and intentional. Um, but thank you. Yes. So my question is for Josh. Mm -hmm. So Josh, how long did it take for you to in working with Bernadette, get her to the place where she began to make those connections. That's with a good the first person or the second person. How long would you say if you can go back into your mind? Mm, that's a good question. Um, there were a lot of different steps that we took in getting Bernadette to where she is now. Um, some of it had to do with, you know, family connections and, and you know, because again, like, so a little history Bernadette lives with her her lived with her father this previously and there was that bond there right like they had been around each other it was just them for years and years and years so half of his future was like well you know I want Bernadette to be in the place that she's comfortable in on her own but I don't want to let go at the same time right there was that attachment there so a lot of it was education and, and just making him feel comfortable, you know, and that took a while. It took, I mean, I've been working, I've been working with Bernadette since 2016. Um, so a while. And, and again, part of that was, uh, you know, educating and making the father feel comfortable. I mean, she was ready to go. She's like, I'll move out to like, she, she there was no, no hesitation on her end at all, like at all. Um, so that took a while. I'm, I'm going to say, I don't know how long Burns been living where she's at on the top of my head. Um, but I'm going to say it took at least four years, three, three to four years to build that relationship with dad. Um, and to get him to the point where he was, he, where he was comfortable when he confided in, in me enough to introduce other folks to, to Burns life. Um, you know, and that, and those other folks would be, would be the neighbors, um, you know, and, and, and develop that and start that partnership. So it took a while. Thank you. And so I like something that Sandy said, uh, that many times as human beings, we want things to happen quickly. But if we could just stay curious, be intentional, and just wait, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes we can be curious, but you know, I, I want the change right now, even though I'm being curious, right? You know, like, you know, get this thing moving here, you know. Um, but I think it's, if we can stay curious, intentional, and just wait, I think those are like the keys to allowing the person to just 
flow on their own, right? Move at their pace and just sort of be there. So I, I appreciated that. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Sierra. Oh, you're welcome. And I know that once Bernadette came to us and it was uh, it was September of 2020, we had been working with her prior with her at her home before we found an apartment in a place that she wanted to stay and live. And when she first moved in, she had other little opportunities throughout the community to do, you know, to, to, to shine in her gifts. But she also was someone that really had relied upon the fact that she had been with dad for so many years. So being out in a social setting, it wasn't just like automatic. She would say inappropriate things all the time, you know, especially to men, right? You know, we have to but then now, after all these years of just taking her out in a safe space, little places at a time, this and that, I don't have to so much worry about her making inappropriate, com you know, comments. But it has taken a minute, you know, because it was an intentional thing to, you know, that we did, and we didn't stop. We just kept trying it again. Sometimes we failed. Sometimes it was a small success. It's not instant. So it can, it's, it's a. There's nothing more brilliant than putting the time and the patience in to something that you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. because it is a tunnel. I mean, you're going to have to get through it, you know. Well, she she had she was anxious about some of it, right? Yeah, she, she was nervous, you know, and rightfully so. Yeah, she lived a life with her her father, who's a beautiful man, and he yeah. just oh my gosh, when you see the two of them together, it's just melts your heart. Mm -hmm. but they really learned how to communicate with each other like so they had this banter that would go on that when Vern would leave home it, she didn't realize that everybody wouldn't banter with her like dad and find that so we had to kind of help her figure out oh gosh like we all do it we all have the way that we kind of you know sink in with our family members and the people that we really care about you don't even have to say things to each other it just kind of you know you know what's going to happen that's what they had so really just trying to be gentle about that like okay yeah that's really cool and funny but this person's going to see it differently because we're in a different setting. So and that would make her then nervous because she's like, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So we even tried some stuff with, you know, sometimes she would just practice with somebody she really trusted around her humor to see where it would kind of fly. And she just learned so much about herself. But we learned so much together about the community that Vern was living in, how open and welcoming they were. She started off there during COVID. The people that worked there were really figuring things out with her. And, and what we found is that People want to participate in life with, with you. Like every people are looking for to fill gaps in their own lives, right? Holes that they have. How do we do that? But never going out and looking for the pity party because that's not what we're doing. We're not selling her disability. We're selling the gifts that she has as someone who likes to bake and loves music and wants to volunteer and wants to be out there and wants to be a good friend and a good neighbor, a dog walker in the community, you know, like all those things. Those are the things we were celebrating. Um, and then never at, in one moment trying to highlight a disability. And that's what we were finding in other places. People were trying to pull the disability pieces and it's like, it doesn't matter because if we're functioning in these other places and she can grow there, that's what matters. And that's where all the growth is going to come from. But she even had to, right, Josh, for even for Burn, because in other places where she'd been in really traditional places, the focus was so much on her disability, not on her gifts. It took her a minute to get courage to live in her gifts. Yeah, she sort of had to unwrap all that and, and sort of undo some of the stuff that had been done over the years surrounding that. And it took her a while, but she's she's there. She's thriving. She's doing amazing. She is awesome. I love her. The, the karaoke thing kills me. This oh, my God. She, that, she, you she you needed to be there, though, to, to see that. So... I'll, I'm going to explain this real quick, and then we can then we can move on. Bernadette has um, developed a relationship with a local art studio. Okay, so and and they have every now and then they have like a karaoke night or like let's you know let's all get together and showcase our artwork or you know whatever it is. So Bernadette, I went. Um, I have a good relationship with the studio, so I went that night, and Bernadette got up and sang karaoke she she screamed to karaoke she didn't really sing it she screamed into the microphone and it was it was beautiful it was amazing the fact that she had the courage to get up there and in front of there must have been 30 people 30 35 people um and and do that was just it was beautiful um but i had to you know had to show sandy and say this is just this is incredible look look at where she's come you know because she wouldn't have done this four years ago there's no way she would have gotten up there 
but she didn't care. She got up there, she sang, screamed, whatever. And it was great. So I'm interested in for the folks that have been in business for 10 weeks. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> like, like, what are you feeling like right now? Like where you sit right now in the work you're doing? I'm just bubbling over, Sandy. Just bubbling over. Well, What's great about, what do you bubble over about? Like really seriously, like what is the best thing in your day right now? I think for me, Sandy, it's just being in the presence of the person. And even if in my mind, I think I made an inch today, it's like, whoa, we made an inch, right? Because I know it's a big step for that person, right? And so that's what sort of thrills me and just gets me excited and causes me to want to go back, right? And try somebody else, right? It's that knowing that, oh, they made a step. Oh, and I know it cost them like, a, you know, this big thing for them to do, but we did it. And I know that there's more to come for the person, right? So that, that's what really like excites me. I get excited, like chills all over my body, right? And I'm waiting for the Peacemaker Chapter 2, because I think the, the obviously the catalyst uh, example of Bernadette, you're already on that track and trying to find a new and interesting group where your buddy can be comfortable and figure it out. And that would not have happened without... Bernadette screaming karaoke. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, <clears throat> I've done stuff with biker gangs and a lot of other stuff that a lot of people thought, no, that's not appropriate. Turns out to be bloody miraculous sometimes. Got to find the right people. They're always there. And they're anxious uh, to participate. Hungry to participate. So, yeah. So, so in the spirit of being curious, um, both of you, Neighbors and Bridges, are based in New Jersey. Correct. And I, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with the self-direction system in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, because I, I'm just I don't want to hijack the meeting, but I'm curious about this, and we've got 20 minutes. And I made a discovery about New Jersey last Friday. Okay. And uh, when I presented it to NYCC a few minutes ago, they had some great questions around, well, these things about New Jersey sound great, but what are the challenges? So let me, let me just throw up on the screen for you uh, a summary of what seems to be where New York City really, where I'm sorry, where New Jersey really shines in comparison to what we're dealing with in New York. And it's specifically around community classes. So my understanding is that in New Jersey, the state decides, the state pays directly to the vendor, the financial accountability is on the state, they send a notice of decision and you always have a right to a fair hearing. Contrast that with New York, where the decision maker is a FI, a fiscal intermediary. The family usually has to reach into their pocket to pay. The, fi the fiscal intermediary is held accountable. So if the feds come in and say that was a bad decision, the state is whole and it's the fiscal intermediary that goes bankrupt. There's never a notice of decision sent, and the state is saying that we don't have a right to a fair hearing. So I look at this comparison, and it's like, hmm, I'm tempted to move to New Jersey. Uh, but when I, I, I'm not going to. I'm going to try and make New York look more like New Jersey in these areas. But what are, what are the problems that New Jersey is facing right now? What are the difficulties? Because this was the vision of things presented to me by the state and the state always has a different viewpoint than the people who are managing services, the people who are getting services. So 
in self-direction or, or for the full system in New Jersey, it's just moved from uh, contract-based services. And I say just like over the last three or four years, it's been changing for folks in community living for support coordination. That process started changing a few years before that. Um, so the, the person's generally in charge of what's happening within the budget that they're assigned. So they're driving the decision-making, whether it's in self-direction, a group home, or in the <laughs> way that we provide services. So they're directing where they're going in their life around the services that are offered to them under the waiver that they're in. Most of the people that we work for, Josh and I, generally live in the community care program. It's just the bigger waiver in New Jersey. But although Josh dabbles over in the supports program as well, because he's in support coordination, we only work with people in the CCP program. So it's the bigger waiver. Um, for folks that are self-directing, your, your chart is somewhat right, but in some ways not correct. Well, it is somewhat right because even in New Jersey now, since they moved from a state funded service to fee for service, the fiscal intermediary is responsible. The providers are responsible. So if there's an audit that comes into to play, we're gonna be the ones held accountable now. Before the state of New Jersey was held accountable for everything because they were the responsible recipient of all the money. And then they would just, they would send the money out to us through our contracts. Now we are actually getting paid directly from Medicaid like most other states are. So that that part of it is actually the fiscal intermediary here is ppl and if something happens where notes aren't taken things aren't happening audits happen they're going to be held responsible because they are the person collecting all that information and making the payments directly to the employee under the so, so that's that's with regard to come have yeah yeah, yeah. but and but for come have's different than the community class under self-direction it's the same thing because it's self-direction it's where the folks are, are spending their time so it, it's still the fiscal intermediary that's responsible in our world of living it's us as neighbors because we no longer have an actual contract with the state i mean we do for them to oversee us but our contract with regard to services and payment is through medicaid directly we bill directly through medicaid so if there's an audit that comes in the state might have an audit that happens but they're moving all that financial responsibility over to the providers and to the fiscal intermediaries so they don't have as much of that responsibility because they were getting creamed at every audit Mm -hmm. um, but I will say this to you. There's a group of people here in New Jersey, and Josh is part of this conversation, where we're working with other Can states hang up? self direction. Oh, are you still there? Oh, no, sorry. I... Keep we're, going. We're working with folks around self direction. So if you'd like to, we were actually going to invite some folks from New York to be a part of this conversation to say what's working in New Jersey, what's working in New York, what's not working in New Jersey, what's not working in New York, and can we share some time together? Yeah. Um, and I think Jen is also probably going to be part of that as well. So if you're interested, we'll add you to that list. And if you'll send me quickly your information, I probably have your email at least probably in the in the information from Jack and those guys anyway. Um, I'll send you an invitation to that conversation if you'd like. That would be great. All right. And Josh is a part of that group as well. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, aside from the technical stuff, right, of, of self-direction, I think one of the things that I've noticed anyway, I had the opportunity to be in support coordination prior to or during the shift, you know, to fee for service. Um, and I've noticed a difference in mindset, right? And I think we're I think we're we're coming back around, right? We're to where we need to be to really highlight self-direction. But I noticed, you know, the past, I don't know, five or six years, whatever it is, there's been more push for the congregate settings, more push for day programs, more push for group homes. And not that there's anything wrong. I mean, it, it is what it is, right? Whatever, whatever people are, are you know, fits everybody's um, whatever they want. But there's been a lack of, and again, this is this is changing. There's been a lack of conversation surrounding self-direction in the in the component of educating families. And I think that's the tough piece, right? Like, how do we get all the word out to everybody that, you know, self-direction is an option. Um, I, I've sat with tons and tons and tons of families and, you know, tried to, you know, do the best that I can to, to educate people and provide resources and stuff like that. And sometimes it's successful. Sometimes it's not, you know, um, and I, I just think that there's a lot of gaps, especially surrounding the longevity of it, right? Like, I think a lot of families see that, that self-direction is beautiful right now, while I as the parent am still here, but like, it's the question that everybody has, what happens when I'm not? Like, where does that go? Where does my loved one that's living on his own or her own, what happens after that? So, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just think that there's, you know, there's work to be done all over the place, you know, but we're getting there. 
Yeah, and Mary and I are, I are doing a uh, safe to fail probe on that very question um, where I've gotten permission from the state to use Medicaid funds to hire Marietta as a personal support network facilitator uh, and to help strengthen the personal support network around my son. And our hope is that this will become a model that we can spread to uh, all 130,000 people who are getting waiver services in, in New York State. It's something that's been done for 100 people in Canada, privately paid for, for several decades now, and they've had success there. But it's um, essentially a, a tiny group of fairly well-to-do people who could leave a bequest that would fund the personal support network facilitator, who would then keep that network around the person of the the person in the center would be uh would would have a continuing network of family and friends and and uh and other people associated with them and they've succeeded right for for decades now there have been networks around and supporting someone after their parents are gone so we'll have to we'll have to see what what comes next here in New York, but it's uh, something that I got permission to do from the state under the support broker budget line years ago. It took a while though for us to get it, get all the ingredients together. So Mary has been working with my son for about three months now. And I think that's one reason why she was curious about how long it takes. Um, but I, and I think what you've done with Bernadette, if, if I understand it correctly, is a similar model. It's you've created a network around her that will survive if, if it continues to be nurtured over time. And that's, that's the lesson from the plan of Canada is that that network has to continue to be nurtured over time. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're right on, Jim, that maintaining, you can call them circles of support, networks, you can call them whatever you need to, but they need you need to invest in the maintenance of that network because with the best of intentions, there's a surge of activity and then people begin to relax and life happens. And then we're back where we started. So it needs not... A lot of work once you get it up and running, but it'll it'll be unpredictable when you need it. <laughs> and the best answer is to invest early and often. <laughs> Main maintenance of the network, absolutely critical. Yeah, and what and what they've found in Canada is that it takes somebody who's been trained to be a facilitator. It takes them. Um, between three and eight hours a week yeah. to to maintain that network over time. Yeah. So, so this is plan of Canada and, and what they do is they uh, create and sustain these intentional networks. And Marion and I Marietta and I went through the oops, went through the training with them. How long ago was it? Oh, I think it was during COVID, uh, 2020? No, no, 20... I think it was pre-COVID, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been a long road for us to get to um, bringing it to New York and, and bringing it out of private pay to um, into, into uh, Medicaid paid. But this is important. They don't use, similar to what you were talking about with neighbors and bridges, they, they use an asset-based approach to identify gifts. Yep. And then, and what I would say is they, the word they leave out of here is then rely on the power of assisted networking and assisted friendship. Because right? people, people like my son and Bernadette and, and others 
have difficulty creating and sustaining those networks on their own. Yeah. So it's the paid professional isn't their friend. Their paid the paid professional is the person who helps develop and maintain those links. So it's a great model. Yep. You know, I, I believe that there are a lot of tools that are out there, right? Because it's, it's, I don't believe that one tool should be used for every person, but I think it's important to, you know, um, use different tools. And as you get to know the person, you, you recognize which tool you use with the person. And I think, you know, many times people look at one specific tool and say, oh, you know, use this, but I find that you have to get to know the person first, spend some time with the person first to see which tool exactly you'd pull out your pocket to, to support the person. And so I think the key is trying to develop as many tools as we possibly can to know when the specific tool should be used for this X, Y, and Z person, right? Um, I've used the plan tool with some people and I've not used the plan tool with other people. I've used something else, right? And I think that's the key, you know, us, being in the place where we recognize that, okay, now I can't use this tool here. I need to use this first. I need to sort of develop something here with this person before I can use another tool, right? And I think that's really the key, being as um, learners ourselves, right? Constantly growing and learning and figuring things out um, as we go through this walk. Yeah, and, and thank you for the correction, Marietta. I meant, I meant available to all, not, not, not used by all. What else are people curious about? We've we've committed to curiosity. Let's let's indulge ourselves for another uh, eight minutes. I would be curious to know. I personally would be curious to know from people: Is there something that has happened in the last month, week, day, whatever, that really made your heart feel good, like at work, at home? And how did you get there? What took you to that place? So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go because Sandy, I shared this story with you the other day, and this is you know your your prompt for me to talk. So here I go. Um, <clears throat> the other year, about two years ago, I had the opportunity to meet a young man um, that lived adjacent to Bernadette's community. Okay, so we talked about Bernadette before. This young man, uh, his name is EJ. Um, EJ does a lot of stuff in his community between. Um, you know, just, just being there for people, uh, you know, out when it snows, he goes out and he shovels people's sidewalks. Um, you know, he, he visits people in the community. Like he knows everybody, everybody and anybody, um, in the community. So, um, he's a young man that, um, that again, I've, I've known a little bit of time. Um, and I've, I've had the opportunity a couple of years ago to spend some, some time with him to spend a weekend with him at a, at a conference. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, the past couple of years, I've, I've been texting with him and, and chatting with him when I can. And I'm on a group on Facebook that, that EJ is part of. It's, it's for the community that he lives in, right? It's Frenchtown, New Jersey, um, community people or whatever it's called. So I saw a post the one day by a gentleman. Um, his name is Matt. And it was about EJ. And it was EJ's birthday is coming up. And we want to show him how much we love him. And it was this long post um, about what they wanted to do for EJ and they wanted to throw him a birthday party. The community itself got together, raised money, got donations, talked to bake shops. Um, they, they rented a space at, um, at, at, at a, uh, a Legion um, and they threw him a birthday party. People got him gifts. And this was all prompted by the community. It was, it was not a provider managed thing at all. It, it was, it was the, and it was, it was beautiful. Um, I went, I spent about two hours there um, and hung out with EJ and it was, it was amazing. Um, I've, I've actually talked to, I've been in contact with the, the gentleman that started it. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I do some advocacy stuff on the, you know, with another, uh, uh, an organization in New Jersey and I'm going to be having them, uh, EJ and, and the gentleman on, on, in our group, um, for a presentation, hopefully this coming week. Um, but it was beautiful. It was, you know, uh, the community just coming together to show somebody how much he's appreciated. It was, 
unbelievable. I knew you were burning to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but EJ is famous on Facebook around our area, like all these nice things. I mean, he's just, you know, he is. He's a, cool. he's a great guy. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for sharing that, Josh. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that I had the opportunity to go up and see our friend Matt. I know that Peace has not able to, you know, really communicate um, with his, you know, his situation right now. And I know we had walked away last week with like, you know, let's just go back to Matt and say, you know, where can we start? Like, what would you like to try and start? What would you like to do? And to use all those big words with Matt, it's not going to go very well first thing in the morning. <laughs> you know, he has to get up and get going, right, Peace? And we just kept, you know, I was just like, oh, well, what would you like to do? Because he kept saying he wanted to do something. I'm like, well, what would you like to do? And again, he just was back into that. I just want to go to the Y. And I'm like, okay, well, we can actually, you know, make that happen. And, but it's like, he can't think outside of what his reality has been. So we just have to do like little baby steps with it. When I see him again over the weekend or early next week, it'll be, oh, would you like to come down for dinner or something like that? And we'll have a basketball game and some brunch or whatever. So we're going to try and get him out of his little, his little shell that he's, you know, in because it's a safe space to kind of fall. And, you know, so I thought that was kind of nice. At least Matt's thinking, you know, of different, hopefully it's going to take a minute, but it's, you know, hopefully we can get a new little thread kind of going up in his community and I'll go out and do some walks with you guys if you want. And I don't know, I can always find a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to drive there for like two years until we can make a connection, you know, to, you know, to see whether or not it's a good one or a fit for him, but I'm willing to make the commitment and we'll, we'll get it done. Peace. Yeah. I have a story that it's going to sound like it's not a heartwarming story at the beginning when I start, but it really is. Um, we lost a person that we love very much, um, that we've supported and I've known him for 30 years, but we've supported him for about 14. Um, he died unexpectedly last week. And, uh, I was talking with his mom who is like the rock star in my world. She's done more advocacy in the state of New Jersey and changed people's lives than anybody that I, I know. And she does it with such grace. It's incredible. Um, so I was talking to her who she was sick. She had COVID, couldn't be with her son when he died. She had to make decisions about his death over the phone, about him, whether he would need to come stay on a machine or come off of it. So I call her and I say to her, I just wanted to check on you. My heart is so broken for you. And she said, she said to me, she goes, Sandy, he had such a good life, didn't he? She was like, he lived so big. And she was like, at, they told me he wouldn't see five. And then they told me he wouldn't see 10. And then they told me he wouldn't see 20. And she says, so for every day after his fifth birthday, it was a blessing to us. And for 47 years, he beat every odd. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, when we do this work and you're doing it with intention and you're giving your heart to the people, these losses are so tremendously huge, but those successes to hear a mom be so comforted by the life her child lived. And he was, he was so medically frail and complicated and he lived such a good life with the people who were with him. His person who supported him had been with him for 20 years um, because she loved him. And because Ellie mom loved her and she loved on her and her family. And I just think that that was just a beautiful thing to watch, even in loss, all of the love and the, the, the heartfelt space that Ellie shared with all of us as a mom who was in mourning. And she, I think, took better care of us than we took care of her. Anyway, that was my story that wore my heart. And I think it's so beautiful, right? Because we all want to leave a legacy. And look at the legacy that was left. She lived a good life. Because that's what we want, right? We want the person to live a good life. So for mom to be able to say, lived a good life. I mean, what more? <laughs> exactly. What more can be said? She lived a good life. Because that's what we want. Yeah. Yep. Sweet story. Thank you, everybody, for your time. It was great. Thank you.